O oh God, be in my mouth as I speak for you. Fill this place with your great grace, that we may leave this place less of what we used to be, more of what we ought to be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, the joys of technology. You know. <laughs> From our gospel this morning, Jesus looking at him, he loved him, he loved him, and he said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. This verse is perhaps the most challenging thing Jesus ever said in the Gospels. And as I was thinking about this familiar passage this past week, I, I found myself thinking about two different stories. One story talks about stewardship, and the other gives an example of what it means for us to leave everything behind and follow our Lord. So if you'll indulge me, I want to share these two stories with you, and hopefully by the time I wind up my sermon, we'll find some answers, or at least know a bit more about grappling with what it means to follow Christ. Now, my first story concerns a young couple that was coming back from church with their eight-year-old son, Jimmy. The father was driving. He remarked to his wife that the sermon was one of the worst he had ever heard. It was too long, uninspired, and he couldn't remember a single point. Every preacher's worst nightmare. <laughs> the mother agreed and added that she had been disappointed in the singing of the choir. This was not St. James's, just to let you know. <clears throat> The musical piece they performed was not one of her favorites, not to mention the sopranos were flat and the tenors were weak. <laughs> As both parents continued to discuss all the things that were wrong with the service, they heard a voice from the back seat. Well, gee, Mom and Dad, Jimmy piped up, I thought that was a pretty good show for only a dollar. <laughs> My second story concerns a popular legend about St. Francis. Last week, we celebrated his feast day with the blessing of the animals. Now, when Francis was a young man, it was told that he was walking through the woods one day, and he came upon this dilapidated church. As he stood in the ruins of the building, he had a vision. He heard a voice calling out to him from the crucifix, telling him, Francis, repair my church. Francis immediately went home. He took some bolts of cloth from his father's warehouse. His father was a wealthy merchant. He sold them. He delivered them the money to the priest who lived there to pay for the repairs to the chapel. Now his father, Pietro, was enraged by his son's extravagance. He brought a complaint against his son which was resolved in the public square of Assisi before the local bishop. After the bishop admonished him for stealing from his father, the bishop gave Francis the money and advised him to return to his father what was his. Francis declared, My Lord Bishop, not only will I gladly give back the money which is my father's, but also my clothes. He stripped, off of his he stripped off his clothes, he, he placed the money on top of them, and standing naked before the bishop, his father, and all that were present, he announced, listen, all of you, and mark these words. Hitherto I have called Pietro Bernardone my father, but because I am resolved to serve God, I return to him the money on account of which he was so perturbed, and also the clothes I wore, which belonged to him. From now on, I will say, Our Father, who art in heaven, and not Father Pietro. The crowd was much moved by the spectacle. They wept in sympathy with Francis, and the bishop, so moved, covered the naked and rebellious youth with his very own cloak. Now, in our popular culture, Francis tends to be something of a benign a domesticated figure. You found him in our gardens among the trees and the birds. 
We don't often think of Francis as some kind of rebel. But in stripping off his clothes, putting his father's money on top, standing before that crowd, he takes Jesus' words from this morning's gospel in the most liter literal and radical way possible. He gives up all of his wealth. He gives up all of his privilege. He starts over exchanging an earthly father for a heavenly father. Now, when I hear this story, I am, on the one hand, I'm inspired, inspired by Francis' example. Francis was certainly no peace-loving hippie, but he was someone who boldly attacked the wealth, the corruption of his society and the church of his day. But, on the other hand, if I'm honest with you, I also find saints like Francis a bit annoying. After all, it was the 11th century. You know, you have to think life had to be simpler back then. Francis would not understand all the obligations that I have. He didn't have a mortgage. He didn't have student loans, dental bills, or car payments. Of course, we call Francis a great saint of the church, but let's be honest. He's also someone that makes all of us feel a bit hypocritical. We hear the gospel this morning about what it takes to inherit eternal life, and most of us would prefer to ignore it or just try to explain it all away. None of us sitting here this morning really wants to take the words literally. And so we make the usual excuses. We put the dollar in the plate like Jimmy's parents, and we leave church with a, a vague sense of disquiet in our souls. So you might ask, what's the solution to this quandary? What steps can we all take to renew our spiritual lives and live with a better sense of integrity when it comes to hearing the gospel? Well, after reflecting on this gospel for many years, I have a few thoughts for how we grapple with these difficult questions. First, I've come to believe over time that any decision, any decision about how to follow our Lord, how we handle our money, how we handle our possessions, it must first start with holding up a mirror to ourselves. Like the young man that seeks out Jesus in our gospel, we've all heard the commandments our Lord speaks about. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. We know these outward rules that govern human life. These are the behaviors that everyone sees and everybody knows. These are the rules, my friends, that anyone, anyone sitting here this morning can observe, even if they don't much care about God or other people. And yet, and yet to get at the heart, to get at the heart of what it means to follow Christ, there is something, something critical missing from this list of commandments. And I believe that coming to terms with our Lord's words in the gospel, we must place before all other commandments the very first one, the very first one that Moses gave to God's people. Hear, O Israel. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Hear, O Israel, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. In our story, Jesus looks into the soul of the man who comes to him, and he loves him. He loves him. The gospel tells us that. And yet, he knows that this man has many other gods in his life. And these are the gods which demand his allegiance. He is someone that is controlled by his wealth and not the other way around. This man walks away from eternal life because he thinks, he thinks the wealth and possessions that control his life offer him something better. He fails to realize what C.S. Lewis once noted. He said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get nothing. 
aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in, aim at earth and you will get nothing. While we all may struggle with how to handle our money, our possessions, we need to remember the end purpose of what we have, what we've been entrusted with. Are we aiming at heaven when it comes to what we give, or are we simply content to settle for earthly idols, the earthly idols that we let control all of our lives? The gospel reminds us over and over and over again that Jesus loves us. God loves us. And that all-encompassing love, this can never be taken away. But Jesus is still waiting for us to decide how we choose to use what we have to best follow Him. At St. James's, we are no doubt a community of great doers, great doers for our Lord. But we should always be asking ourselves the difficult questions about what it means to give away, to give away that illusion of control, to follow Christ on the path of true discipleship. Do we have the courage to put away the clothes of our cultural idols, those things we worship? Do we have the courage to put away the idols of success, the idols of status, the idols of money? When it comes to our money and our possessions, I am convinced more than ever that fear, fear controls most of the choices we make and the life that we choose to lead. And our Lord asks us, He says, give that all away. Give away the fear. Give away our anxieties. Use our money. Use our power. Bless, bless the lives of other people. When we have that kind of trust in God that allows us to put more than just that dollar in the plate, I am convinced, I believe that we will all find a peace that truly, truly will pass all human understanding. This morning, I want to invite you to, to hear anew Jesus' words. Give generously to support your beloved church. Have the courage, my friends, to always, to always aim for heaven in the lives that you and I choose to live. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. Use us, we pray, as you will and always, to your glory and welfare of your people. Through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.